please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Great to see all of you here today. Today we begin a new study in a new book. Still the Bible. There's 66 books of the Bible. We've studied a few of them now. They're not going to add any more, and if they do, watch out. There is no other gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that? Amen. They're not going to take any of them away, and there's not going to add any to. This is the word, the complete word of God. So thankful for it, and I know you are too. I feel like I use the word excited too much. Do I get on your nerves sometimes with my use of the word excited? I get on my own nerves. I'm like, ugh. And so I typed up the thesaurus, and I said, let's get another word. And so... I am so thrilled <laughs> to be entering into a new study with you in this book. I pray you are too. And so let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to let the content of the letter reveal the context of the situation. If I told you all about Timothy and just kind of gave you this outline of all about Timothy, then when we got into it, it would be a little bit redundant. So we're just going to read it and talk about it as it arises, if that's okay with everybody. And so let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Are you energized? Are you stirred up? Are you roused and enlivened? That's all I got. Amen. Here we go. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. If you read that sentence, it seems like different than we usually say these things. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus. Where? Yay! So that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. And we'll stop right there and have a word of prayer. God, you are our Savior. Help us to understand that. I pray that today uh, that reality will sink deeper into our hearts, bringing us hope and joy in Jesus Christ. And God, we pray that as we gather now in this time, as we are broadcast online, I pray with all my heart that those listening now in this time, the Holy Spirit will move among us bringing salvation to those who've not yet trusted you. They're, they're thinking about what it cost, and God, thank you for that honesty. But help them to see that you're worth everything. And so, God, please, bring salvation, bring the breakthrough of faith in lives today as we listen to your word. And God, I, as we look at your word and God, I pray that those of us who know you, Lord, will hear your, you commanding us to keep going, to grow, and to serve, to be obedient. And now, Lord, we just, we are happy, truly happy and joyful to read these words now and discuss them as your Spirit leads us together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Jesus. Christ Jesus, our hope. In his name we pray. Amen. Looking at the first three verses, we have characters. If I can call them characters, I don't know a better way to explain it. But we have characters. Well, you're just jumping right in there, aren't you? Moving on. <laughs> Not you in a hurry today. <laughs> we have characters. Uh, in, the, uh, in the verses, we've got an apostle, we've got a pastor, we've got a church, a people, and we've got a savior, and those are our characters. If, if 
if that's the best word that we can come up with to say those things. And so let's look at these four primary characters today and let that be the structure for our looking at these first three verses. And the first character that we see is the very first word of the chapter, Paul, an apostle. You know what apostle means? Most of you do, some of you might not. Apostol, apostol, ap, apostolos. Probably not saying that right. Someone who is sent. Sent. The apo prefix em- emphasizes the notability of the sender. And so there's, there's great oomph, there's great power in the sender sending this Apollos, or this, this, this apostle, this apostle, the sent one, with this message. He's a delegate of a very important message. He's a representative carrying authority, the authority of the one who sent him. And, this, and, and the Bible uses this word apostle in a broad sense and a narrow sense. Now, you know that, right? There's, there's the broad sense of apostle and then there's narrow. When we, we, we still use the word apostle today, and we, in the New Testament we have the office of apostle or, or the spiritual gift of being an apostle, and that is, that is like a missionary, somebody who's sent. You've got the gospel, take it somewhere. We're sending you to go, share the gospel where it hasn't yet been heard. That's the, that's the apostle, and that's the broad sense of the word. And that is used in that way in the New Testament because we have lots of apostles with little a mentioned in the Bible. Barnabas, Silvanus, James the Lord's brother, Silas, Apollos, Epaphroditus, Andronicus, Junius, Silas, and even Timothy are called Apollo. Uh, I keep saying Apollos. Apostle, thank you. Apostle. With a little a. And that's the broad term. It means missionary. But there's a narrow use of the term. This is the apostles with a capital A. And these are those who have been chosen by Christ, given His authority, have literal, physical, personal knowledge of Christ, and they are eyewitnesses of His, of his resurrection. And that's a small number of men. Peter. Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, John, son of Zebedee, Philip, Bartholomew, whatever happened to Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, he's the lesser James, God bless him, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and the twelfth, always last in the list is Judas. Judas was disqualified, and Matthias, in Acts chapter 1, the Holy Spirit led them to replace Judas with Matthias. What about Paul? Paul says he's an apostle. Is he an apostle? 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of Paul and his apostleship. This is for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So he's been given the authority and the message to bring. He's an apostle. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. That means they died. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So... Paul is an abnormally born apostle. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. He's not an apostle because he wanted to be one. He didn't, he didn't you know, assume this role. I'm going to be an apostle. A church didn't say, hey, you know what? We're going to make you an apostle. God made him an apostle. He's an apostle by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Then he goes on to talk about how he worked harder than the other apostles because of how far God brought him. That's Paul's apostleship. Not one of the twelve, but still an apostle, a different kind of apostle. And he is different. 
And there's a clue as to the difference in Paul versus the other 12 in the way that he addresses Jesus Christ, the way that he refers to Jesus Christ in the first verse and in the second verse. In the first verse, he calls Jesus something twice, and then he says it exactly the same way in the second verse. Do you see it? He says, Paul, an apostle of who? Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here's, here's something that, uh, that we should be aware of. Who else in the New Testament calls Jesus Christ Jesus? Who else, who else uses that order of phrase, Christ Jesus, in the New Testament? You want a hint? Here it is. Nobody. Nobody. No one calls Jesus Christ Jesus but Paul. Not James, not Jude, not John, not Peter, not Luke or any of those ones that Luke interviewed for his gospel, including Mary and the other apostles, not Mark, not Matthew. Paul does not always call Jesus Christ Jesus. That don't, don't, don't. Hear me saying that. He, he calls Jesus Jesus Christ sometimes, but he's the only one who ever says Christ Jesus. Why? Because this is the order in which he encountered him. The other apostles knew Jesus as a man first. And God revealed to them that he was the anointed one from heaven sent to save us. And so to them, he's Jesus the Christ. But how did Paul first? encounter Christ Jesus. He met him. Paul was a different guy growing up. His name was Saul. He was named after the most famous hero from the tribe of Benjamin, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin. King Saul. King Saul. Well, with all the baggage that came with that name. <laughs> King Saul, and then Saul. Saul of Tarsus was a zealous, serious, religious Jew. In Philippians chapter 3, it says that he checked all the boxes. Everything it took to be a serious, zealous, religious Jew, doing all the list, he did them all. You can read those in Philippians 3. And in Galatians 1, verse 13, he says this about himself, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. We'll read more about that in a minute. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He was a rising star. He was a first-round draft pick in Judaism. He was the leading light of the future leaders in Phariseeism. Trained by Gamaliel, he was advancing way beyond those of his peers. In Acts chapter 7, this young leading light of the Pharisees found himself in a situation that changed his life forever. He'll never forget what happened that day. In Acts chapter 7, a man of the church, a man who had become a believer, a Hellenized Jew named Stephen, who actually was a deacon, was meeting with other Hellenized Jews, people who are or were then how he used to be. And he was telling them how he got from where they are to where he is now and how Jesus really is the anointed one from heaven sent from God to save us. And he explained it to them through the Old Testament. He told pretty much the whole story of the Old Testament in those chapters. And in the end, they covered their ears and yelled to the top of their voice to drown out him and his message. Isn't the devil so good at preventing people from hearing? Faith comes from hearing the word about Jesus. And the devil had those people screaming. Can you imagine? They were so enraged and they were looking for leadership and they looked to the ranking Jewish leader in their midst. And there was Saul of Tarsus. 
Saul of Tarsus. And it says in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, Saul approved of their killing him. He'll never be the same. Watching Stephen die and seeing Stephen see Jesus in his last moments. It says in Acts chapter 8, continuing from that verse, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. So on the day that Stephen died, chaos broke out, and there were riots, and they're hunting Christians like it's, I don't know what. Easter egg hunt. Hunting them down to kill them all. A great persecution breaks out. And all except the apostles are scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. We skip to chapter 9, Paul, or Saul, I'm sorry. Saul asked for letters from the chief priest because he wanted to go on, he wanted to take his show on the road. He wanted to go up to Damascus and hunt all the people of the way that he could find there and drag them into prison. And so he, he heads out with this troop of temple soldiers and guards and they're going to go up and they're going to find Christians and they're going to drag them home. And on the way, a bright light, a brilliant bright light, and a voice from heaven causes Paul to fall on the ground and the voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't know that Jesus was the Christ, but he knew who he was encountering was the Christ. And Jesus told him, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And he replied, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what to do. The men that were with him, they they saw, they, 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 they heard a noise, but they didn't see the light and Paul was blind. He didn't eat or drink for three days. God gave a, 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 a vision to a man named Ananias who lived there in Damascus. And, and, uh, and he, he, he said, Ananias, I want you to go and, and pray over Paul, uh, Saul. Uh, he, he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias. Isn't that great God gives you those kind of instructions? He has seen a vision of a man named Ananias. That's you. Coming and laying his hands on him and healing him. It's like, good, hey, this is going to happen. Go to him, he's staying on straight street. Great instructions. God gave him all, Ananias, everything he needed to know. But Ananias, God bless him. This is hard for him because he says, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument. He's an apostle. To proclaim my name to who? The Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. This is his command. This is his apostleship. This is what he must do. He's going to be the one, the first one to cross the cultural barriers and go to the Gentiles. When you see the word Gentile, one of these days, an English translation of the Bible is going to translate that word the way we would use it, ethnicities. It's the Greek word ethnon or ethnos. It's people of foreign races. And he's going to be God's instrument to cross the barriers, the racial barriers, and bring the message to the kings like Caesar. And also the people of Israel are going to hear the word because of the ministry of Saul of Tarsus. 11 or 12 years later, we skip ahead, and we have Barnabas. Barnabas, such a good man. I love Barnabas, don't you, Barnabas? Barnabas was called to pastor the church at Antioch. I wish I'd have put a map in here. I'm so sorry I didn't put a map in here. But you know, if, you, if, you, if you're looking at Israel, and this is the Mediterranean Sea, Antioch's way up here, way up here in Syrian territory, and Jerusalem's down here, the Jordan River, okay? You got, you got this? Yeah. Okay. Well... Somehow, some way, God starts a wonderful church in Antioch. 
I mean, just special. And Barnabas becomes their pastor, which makes them even more special. But it's more than Barnabas can do. He needs help. And so he goes and finds Saul of Tarsus in Tarsus. He goes up to Tarsus and says, come help me with this church. And he, they become kind of the core beginnings of the elders' ministry that goes on in Antioch. And they, they pastor that church for a while. But then God calls Paul and Barnabas to be missionaries. And they go off. After a couple of years there in Antioch, they go off to be missionaries. And they head off to, on their first missionary journey, Cyprus. So they go from Antioch here out into the Mediterranean. There's an island right here. I really wish I'd have given you a map. I'm so sorry. But there's an island right here. And they go to this island. And in this island there, the proconsul, the Roman proconsul, he's very interested in the gospel. He wants to hear more. He's asking them for more. But there's a Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, also called Elimus. And he opposes them and tries to prevent the Roman proconsul from coming to faith. So he's like trying to mess it up. Ah! There's a great, it's a great evil that's going on here where the Jews just don't want the gospel out. They just don't want to offer God to anybody else. And this Jewish sorcerer, he's, he's, he's trying to prevent this proconsul from hearing about God. And something odd happens in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, on this first missionary encounter on the island of Cyprus. It says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul. That's where it changed. Saul kind of ditched his Hebrew name. And took on a Gentile name. Took on his Greek name. Because he knows that it's his command to cross this barrier. And he's just tearing down the barriers. Tearing them down. He needs to connect with people and tell them that God loves them. So now he's changing his name. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul looked straight at Elimus. And said, you're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. And you're going to be blind for a time. Not even able to see the light of the sun. And that's where Saul became Paul. In the next verse, he's leading. Now it's no longer Barnabas and Saul. It's Paul and Barnabas. You've got a flip in the whole situation. Paul commanded Paul to be his apostle, and he carried the burden of God's authority and was faithful with God's message. And he brought the word of God before there was a written word of God. Paul was the apostle. Be careful of people who call themselves apostles today. Because this is the authority. There are, there are no apostles like that anymore. This is the authority. Great danger is... Is, is, is had in people saying, I've got apostolic authority. Because only this is our authority. If you take the word of God, if you take the message as a missionary, as an as a apostle little a to a tribe that's never heard the word before, and, and you're telling them about Jesus, the authority is not in what you say. Every one of those tribal people can say, well, can you show it to us in God's word? Because that's where the authority is. Lies. Always will. That's not going to change. So we have the Apostle Paul. And we have the Pastor Timothy. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. What's the difference between an Apostle and a Pastor? Anyone? 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 An Apostle is told to go. And a Pastor is told to stay. And they're all told to fetch. But that's a whole other thing too. Apostles are to go and pastors are to stay. And it says here in verse 3, I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach doctrines, false doctrines, any longer. Jesus said about pastors in John 10, he said, The hired hand is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, 
So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When the wolf attacks and the flock scatter, when the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Paul's like, don't, don't do that. And Timothy's not. He's going to stay because it's in his heart and it's his calling. And you'll see something special about Timothy. Timothy had a challenging upbringing. What do you know about Timothy? You know a lot or a little? Can I teach you a little bit more? Maybe it's something you already know. Timothy was of mixed racial heritage. His mother was a Jew. He was half Jew, and his father was a Greek. He was a, a different ethnos. He was a different race. He was a different religion. He, so he was half Jew, half ethnos, okay? Half Gentile. Now, if you are a Jew in those days, what, did, what kind of regard did you have for people who were half Jew? None. Remember how they saw the Samaritans who were not of pure Jewish blood. And so poor Timothy grew up with a, an identity crisis. Who am I? And he faced brutal racism and prejudice in a time when there was no nicety about it. Naked bigotry. But his mom and his grandmother, they loved him. They taught him about God as best they could. They were Jews and they taught him the Old Testament. The love of God is found there. And then Paul, who he'd never met before, never seen before, came to Lystra. Now, if you want an interesting story, read about Lystra and Paul and Barnabas' experience in Lystra. The people of Lystra had no clue what was going on. They healed a man and they thought, oh, Zeus and Hermes have shown up and they're bringing bulls down the road to sacrifice to them. <laughs> they're going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. And Paul rips his shirt. No, I'm a man just like you. See, don't do this. And somehow that crazy turns into a whole different kind of crazy because the Jews of Iconium and, and Pisidian Antioch come down and they decide they don't want him sharing the gospel with these pagan Gentiles, these other ethnics, and so let's kill him. And so they killed Paul in Lystra. They killed him. And they dragged his body out of the city and left it there dead. But he was only mostly dead. He was not all the way dead. Because he sat back up and he walked back into the city and kept on preaching. Now, you think about being Timothy at 10 or so and watching that go down. You ever going to forget about that? Timothy, his mother, and his grandmother are all saved during that trip. And four or five years later, when Timothy's around 15, Paul came back. Acts 16, verse 1 says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. His mother was Jewish and a believer, but it, whose father was a Greek. And it makes it very clear, his father's not a believer. Okay. Now, he can be. He's Greek. Doesn't mean he can't be a believer, but he's not a believer at that time. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. And Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because the Jews who lived in that area for all, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, guys, let me just tell you that we need to humble ourselves and not demand our rights so that the gospel can move forward without hindrance. Timothy did not have to do this. He did not have to do this. But for the sake of the gospel, he endured this because there needed to be no hindrance. He became all things to all people. He gave up his own right. Because he didn't, nobody said, the gods certainly didn't say he had to be circumcised. In fact, he said the opposite. You read the book of Galatians. But for the sake of the gospel and the lost who wouldn't understand, he was circumcised. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. And the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. That's when Timothy joined the band. Now, there's a whole lot to be said about Paul calling Timothy his true son. 
okay? If you want to hear a whole lot about Paul calling Timothy his true son, John MacArthur preached three sermons on that. Timothy, my true son, okay? If you want to hear a whole bunch of stuff like that, go. I listened to two of them, and I said, okay, I think I get the point, yeah. Uh, but uh, as much as there is to say about all that, I just want to say two things, okay? Let me just boil it down to two things. One is that Timothy is Paul's true son in the faith because Timothy got it. Timothy got it. Paul trained a whole lot of people for missions. He discipled a whole lot of people and brought them along, and a whole lot of people helped him in this ministry. But nobody got it like Timothy did. Paul could send Timothy to Berea or Thessalonica or Philippi or Corinth or Ephesus, and he did. And Timothy would do the right thing because he'd been trained completely. He he was paying attention when he was being trained. He was doing what Paul would have him do, and he was doing it the right way. So he was good. He was the best. This is Philippians 2. Paul's speaking to the Philippians about sending Timothy to them. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I, also, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him. He's got a lot of people. He's got nobody like Timothy who will show genuine concern for your welfare. There's a pastor who will show genuine concern for your welfare where everyone looks out for their own interests. Not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy got it. Paul was an extremely... You read the New Testament. Paul was an extremely driven missionary. He was an apostle who God trusted with this word and he did not let up. And a lot of the people who worked with him disappointed him. They would abandon him. They they, they would look out for their own interest, not for the interest of Jesus Christ. And so he'd say, we got to go. We got to do this. And they'd say, well, I got a job. We got to go. We got to do this. Well, I got to let the dog out. We got to go. We got to do this. We got to share the gospel. These people got to hear and... Looking out for their own interest rather than the interest of Jesus Christ. Most of Paul's helpers disappointed him. Looking out for their own interest. But like Paul, Timothy was all the way in. All in. You know who wasn't Paul's true son? Somebody guessed this in the first service. They just blurted it out. You know who was not his true son in the faith? John... uh, See, you guys are so good. John Mark. Big difference, isn't it? John Mark had a lot of uh, advantage. He was a well-to-do Jewish believer. He thought he was ready to go. I mean, his mom had a home that was big enough for the church to meet in. They, you know, and he, he witnessed Jesus as a boy. He actually knew Jesus, Mark did. He thought he was ready to go on the missionary journey. But it just began. They went from Cyprus to Perga and Pamphylia. And he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready to cross the the racial barriers. He wasn't ready to face the persecution. He wasn't ready to take the stand. And he left them. But later on in his life, he got there. Good old Barnabas gave him another chance. God bless Barnabases. We can't all be Pauls, but maybe we can be Barnabases. He accompanied Peter, Mark did, later in the ministry. He wrote a really good gospel account. You should read it sometime. It's good. It's short, too, compared to the other ones. You should read it. And in 2 Timothy 4, one of the last things that Paul says in his life is only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, Timothy, because he's helpful to me in my ministry. So Mark got there. So Timothy got it. And then the next thing we see about this, Timothy, my true son in the faith, 
is that our Christian fellowship is family. Our Christian fellowship is family. You understand that? If we're not treating each other in the good way like family, not in the bad way like family, but in the good way like family, if we're not looking out for one another and caring for one another, making time for one another and including each other in our lives, we're not doing this right. Paul, who had no wife and no child, says to Timothy, who has no Christian father, you're my true son in the faith. Sometimes we're closer to our people, our family of faith than we are our family of origin because we understand each other and we have the same heart. We need to love each other and look after each other and be true brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers, daughters and son in the faith. Amen. But Jesus said, Jesus said, my, my real mother, brother, or sisters are those who do the will of God, who hear the word of God and do it. And I heard recently this, this verse out of Psalm 68, 6. Have you heard this verse lately? Psalm 68, 6. It says, God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. I'm praying real hard that that happens in Mariupol. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. You don't have to be lonely. God sets the, lo the lonely in families. You can come home to God's people. And so as we continue to look at the characters, we've got the apostle, we've got the pastor. Let's look at the church, the people. What church is this that he has to stay with? Ephesus! I urge you when I went to Macedonia to stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach the doc false doctrines any longer. I hope and pray you've been paying attention. Le May 23rd of last year, we went on a trip. We started on a trip in our little rocket ship. I don't know if you remember this, right? We started in Acts chapter 18, and our goal was to drain the New Testament of everything Ephesus, Okay? So we studied Acts 18 and 19 and 20 and how the church started there. Then we turned in July 11th of last summer to the study, and we started the study in the book of Ephesians. We finished right before Easter because we're really slow. You guys got to start listening faster. <laughs> but we're not done yet. God has more to say to this church as it goes across. We're, just, we're studying a church across its timeline and this is a valuable, important study, and you're going to see just how important as things unfold. I told another pastor what we were doing. He says, man, that's, I've never heard anybody doing that. You should write a book. I don't have time to write a book, but if any of you want to write it, I'll give you my notes, and you just give the money to the church, and that'll be our agreement. You're thinking about it. Hmm. Ephesus. Remember Ephesus? The great Roman city, very cosmopolitan, major Roman roads that go to the east towards Babylon and the north towards Macedonia and south towards Africa. They're on the west, they've got this major seaport where the whole world shows up. This is the crossroads of commerce and travel and thought. Everybody's coming through this great city of Ephesus. And there they have the temple to Artemis, one of the ancient wonders of the world. In that temple of Artemis, they've got this rock that's got all these bumps all over it. And they say, this is the goddess Artemis who fell from the sky. And they have all this horrible sin that goes into the worship of Artemis. Every sin imaginable in that temple. I don't know if you remember, but Ephesus was dark and dripping with demonic influence and presence. It, it was dark and dripping with demonic influence and presence. Demons felt at home in Ephesus. But God loved the people who lived there. And something happened. I'm sure it was just coincidence. But Paul and Priscilla and Aquila were coming home from the second missionary journey, and they happened to kind of have a layover in Ephesus. Again, I'm sure there was no design to this whatsoever. 
But you know what they do, and they sharing the gospel while they're there. And the people say, hmm, we'd like to hear more about that. And so Priscilla and Aquila stay at Acts 18 in the year 52 A.D. And you're going to have to give me a year or two, plus or minus, on these dates. On this third missionary journey in 54 A.D., Paul went back. God started doing amazing things in Ephesus. Do you remember this? Acts chapter 19, it says that everyone in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Everybody in Asia heard the word of the Lord because of the ministry in Ephesus. Man, the name, it says, of Jesus grew in power. So much so that sorcerers were using the name of Jesus to drive out demons and try to heal people. You remember how that worked out? The seven sons of Sceva. They said, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, we command you to get out. And those demons said, we know Jesus and we know about Paul, but we don't know you. And stripped those guys naked and beat them up and ran, ran them out of the house. Jesus was winning great victories in Ephesus. This is how the church began with great power as the word of God spread. Paul's towels had healing power. Do you remember this? They brought their sorcery scrolls and, their, and they burned them in the fire. The idol makers that made these silver Artemis idols were losing business, so they started a riot. The gospel flipped Ephesus on its head. And they stayed there for three years, establishing this church. In 58 A.D., at the end of the third missionary journey, Paul came back, met with the elders, and gave them encouragement and warning. Told them that from among them, wolves would rise up to try to draw a following after themselves. And between 61 and 62, Paul was in prison. You remember this. This is when we were studying Ephesians. And he wrote the letters to the Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And in Ephesians, we learned about what we believe, who we are. We are a manifold, multi-ethnic, extraordinary, completely unique assemblage of peoples in Christ where the dividing walls are all broken down and now we are one new humanity in Christ Jesus. I love that, don't you? To the glory of the name of Christ in the heavenly and earthly realms, we are the church. We learned how we should walk, and we learned how we must war in the book of Ephesians. He wrote them. Now it's 63 A.D. Paul has had his trial before Caesar, and he's been set free for a moment. There are places and events. Timothy, first and second, and Titus tell us things that Paul did that aren't in Acts. Acts ends with Paul still in house, under house arrest. And things go on after he is let out for a season that are documented in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus that we don't have in Acts. They didn't happen in Acts. He wintered in Nicopolis. He left his cloak in Troas. He abandoned Trophimus in Miletus. So these are things that we didn't see. They, couldn't, they didn't fit in Acts anywhere. Eusebius, the historian, wrote in the 300s of Paul's release and his resuming missionary and apostolic work for a short period of time. And it's during that season where he's out that he writes 1 Timothy. The church now is 11 years old and something's very wrong. Something's very wrong. And if we're not providentially hindered, we'll look at that next week. But let's go on now and finish by looking at the solution. The Savior. God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. God our Savior. Is God the Father our Savior? Usually we tell people that they've got to accept Jesus as the Savior, right? Is God the Father the Savior? Everybody thinks that God's the mad one. <laughs> and Jesus is the nice one. Look at 
1 John 4, 9 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. There is no greater love than to give your child, your only son, for the salvation of someone else. God is our Savior. The Father gave His Son, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Jesus said, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. It was God's plan. Jesus was faithful to execute it. You're not going to get the smallest subatomic particle between God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're all of the same heart. Same plan, same being. But God the Father is our Savior. Jesus prayed in the garden. He fell on his face to the ground and he said, My Father, if it's possible for this, for this cup to be taken from me, yet not my will, but as, but as you will, let your will be done. The Father is our Savior. And so is the Son. And Jesus is our hope. Have you noticed that this world is a mess and it's getting messier? Have you? COVID made people unstable in a lot of ways. I'm not sure we're back yet. It's messy. People are trying to find meaning and peace and hope in all kinds of things possessions. Oh, if I just had one more room on my house, I just need one more room on my house, then I'd be happy, you know. Because evidently that's where we would put everything and everything would be wonderful if everything was, if we had one more room in our house. If I just had one more thing, you know. If I could just have that motorcycle, I would be happy. Then I would be full of hope and happiness. Distractions. If I don't have to think about the serious stuff, then it won't bother me and I won't have anxiety. So let me do whatever it takes with hobby or habit or whatever so that I won't think about it. Whatever it takes so I won't think about it. And it's just getting worse. We make idols of animals and articles. You got pets and I got pets, right? And we can agree that that's an okay thing. We like our pets. Unless they're cats and that's not okay. Because <laughs> they don't love you. But we're in a situation in this world today where we can't be mentally okay unless Fluffy is in our lap. We are idolizing animals. Fluffy can't give you what you need. But Jesus Christ is our hope. He's our peace. And no other thing, no other article or animal is going to be able to provide for you what you're only going to be, found, what you're only going to be able to find in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, have you accepted Jesus Christ, your only hope? God the Father is our Savior, and He sent Jesus Christ to you. Have you received Him in your life? I'm going to ask the musicians to come and get ready to lead us in a song. I'm going to ask you to where you are, get ready to respond and 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 answer the question, what is God telling you to do today? What has God commanded you? He commanded Paul to cross cultures and bring the message. What's he telling you to do? He's telling some to go. He's telling some to stay. And he's telling some to come. What's he telling you to do? I bet it's one of those three things. Is he telling you to go, to come, or to stay? 
I want to ask you who your true family is. Who is your true family? Have you, met a, have you, have you made a home in his church? And are you looking after your own interests or those of Christ Jesus? Let me pray for you now. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. I just pray with all my heart that all of us will be obedient to Christ as he calls us. Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for this time. And thank you for what we're going to experience as we read through the words of this inspired book. Thank you, Lord, for what we've seen here today. And I pray, God, with all my hearts that we will respond to you now. I pray for those who haven't yet trusted you with their heart. God, help them to see you and fall in love with you and come to you. Lord, we pray for the rest of us, God, that we'll be obedient to you. Whether you're saying, go, stay, come. God, we, we look to you now, asking your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and lead us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand? Why don't you stand?